Okay. Um, here you see a simulation of a continuous rate evolving. Okay. And so you should have already done the slides, and it says also get this example. So done this example from Blackboard as well. Okay. Um, oh, and Sandy Echonaut's here. So I'm being evaluated for my teaching skills, or lack thereof. So to put it in the context of what we've been doing so far, so in the past we've talked about reading trees a lot. We've talked about this continuous time Markov chain with finite state space, CTMC, FSS, right? Which Jeremy's going to talk more about in, in application of that later on today. Okay. Um, parsimony Bayes likelihood, trees and inferences support, and getting trees from data. So at this point you should know how to make trees. You should know something about the models we use to get trees. Okay. So what we're going to do is talk to you about a different model. So phylogenetics, we have, as we saw in the, that annual review paper, so basically three models we use in most of phylogenetics. All right, so this is a discrete state space one. We're going to talk about a continuous one. And then later we're going to talk about a diversification birth death model. Okay. So we're going to talk about the, so the, this other basic model, tree stretching, talk about what that means. And then Jeremy's going to fall, finish off with an application of this for biogeography. All right, so first I want to help, help inform your intuition. So go to Blackboard and download this R script. <coughs> and it's all pre-computed for you. All you need to do is you can change what this function is. So all we're going to do here is take a function that generates random numbers like exponential random numbers, log normal random numbers, and generate one set of them and plot it, and then start adding up five sets of them, adding up ten sets of them, adding up a thousand sets of them. See what these additions lead to. It's the things we discover about this. Yep. So oddly, you need one extra parens here. Yeah, so on the fifth line down, add one more closing parentheses. Yeah, right parentheses. Yes, but that's where the error is, but the, the solution is at that line. So what's happening is this has three left parentheses and only two right parentheses. I was looking for the third right parentheses and find this thing instead. That's what comes from that error. Yep. Okay. Well, let me show you on my computer then. So what you should be getting is this. Okay, so here I'm using an exponential distribution. Okay, and just a single exponential distribution has this shape. Right? If I add up um, one, let me get this. Five, let me get this. If I then get to a thousand, I get this shape. Okay, and this dotted line shows a normal distribution. All right. Let me do the same thing with a log normal. Yeah, I'll show you the code. Put my cursor. Right? 
So all this function does is return the mean from a number of random, random numbers. Okay. So I can change this to our norm, say. Rerun it. And I get this distribution, right? Which a single normal number is, random, is normally distributed. Fine. I can do an exponential distribution. Oh, sorry, a, a uniform distribution. Running with this distribution, right? But no matter which distribution I'm throwing in there, I'm still getting this shape that looks very normal when I add up a lot of these numbers. Okay, what's this called? Central limit theorem, exactly. So we'll talk about what this means, but I mean this is a nice way of showing that this actually works, right? So you can say, okay, I'm going to add up a lot of normal things as normal. Here I'm adding up exponentials, which is weird things, right? With this peak at zero. I mean, and even so, if I add up a whole bunch of them, I get a normal out. Okay, which I didn't believe. I mean, you know, the theorem, it's in stats, everyone says it. But this way I want to show myself, yeah, oh, wow, it actually works. So you can try that too. <coughs> okay. So here's what central limit theorem is. So the sum of a set of independent, identically distributed random variates that come from an arbitrary probability distribution function with finite mean and variance approaches normal distribution. It's very clear, right? Let's unpack it. <coughs> so what's independent and identically distributed? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Make sense to everyone? Okay. What's an example of some data that aren't independent and identically distributed? Right? Good. If I pull all the hearts and there's no more hearts there. What else? Something close to your hearts by this point. Right? So we have Bayesian analyses, right? So those those aren't independent because where you this is autocorrelation to take care of. Good. Oh, right, so there could be uncorrelated rates for rates for rates for evolution on a tree. Yeah. There could also just be the species on a the tree themselves. Right, so the species on the trees aren't independent. Right, we talked about in the past, right? So the reason you have four limbs and pterosaurs have four limbs and, and bats have four limbs isn't due to some wonderful thing about four limbs, these are all tetrapods. Right, so you're not independent of each other. Okay. So <coughs> I'll tell what that means with the grass this in a minute. Okay, random variates, random numbers, right? Okay. Arbitrary probability distribution function. What does that mean? Yeah, pick a pick a function, any function, right? It's kind of it's a very strong statement, right? Pick any function in the world. Well, minor exception, right? So it has to have finite mean and variance, which all the familiar functions have. So there's one call, a function called a Cauchy function that doesn't have this. Okay, a few others that are like this, but in general, any function you throw at it would be like this. Okay. And if that happens, it approaches a normal distribution. Okay, this is cool, right? So you can add up a whole bunch of things from any old function and get a normal out. And normal is good because we know how to use them for lots of things. Okay. We'll talk about how this relates to evolution in a second. Okay. So again, <coughs> here's what you can do with your, that code. All right, so let's look at think about what, what the evolutionary process is, right? So I start off here at this trait value. What can happen next? Well, maybe this selection for a smaller body size, so the size shrinks. Okay, maybe then genetic drift makes an increase in body size. Okay, and so forth. Right. So you have all these factors that add up over time. Affect the species' body sizes. Each end of the graph is independent. What does this lead to? You've got to do this multiple times. But that's what you get to. What? Oh, so if I were to record that you know, from here, from where it ends up, do it again, from where it ends up. The plot of oh, those. those Final points. What's the distribution they have? Normal, right? <coughs> okay. 
Okay. So this is kind of amazing, right? So six species of them evolve on their own with all these different factors playing into them. We get a normal distribution at the end. Okay. So this is very, very powerful for methods. And so a lot of methods we have that deal with continuous traits are premised on this fact. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so what we can do is plug and chug with this equation to get the length, the length of it. So, I, so similarly talked about with discrete states, I can figure out it's probably going from zero to one, right? And figure out that probability. Here I say it's probably going from um, my root state, say zero, to 1.1 for x. Okay. <coughs> and so a lot of Greek here, I'm worried about what that all means. The basic point is that these are the equation where you can plug numbers in and get the length of the Okay? Based on a few things. So the, the, the value, the root state, It's like a standard normal, right? You have the meaning of standard deviation. Look what that means. In R, it's just this. So this equation in R speak is exactly this. Right? Mu, mu, sigma, sigma. Okay. So now for a single branch, I can say, if I start off at 0 and at 1.1, what's the length of that, that, that tip tape? Like that. How about for a full tree? What do I have to do? Mm -hmm. so one, thing, one thing I could do is each individual branch. I right? say, so given the 0, what's the likelihood? So there's this, this one is going from here to 0, and so forth. If I want to integrate over this value here, okay. um, what I can just do is use what we call a multivariate normal. Okay, so you know, bivariate distribution this is multivariate, it's arbitrary numbers. Okay, and it's very similar. Okay, we still have our negative vector means and vector of x's, but it's single x and single means. Okay. And we now have this thingy instead of this thing. We'll have what that means in a minute. So, where are we going? Does this make sense to everyone at this point? Yes, what's, what's, the, what's the big point so far? And the central limit theorem helps us with this. Right? Since we think trait species are evolving through these various processes, um, we can still have this multi normal this multi right normal distribution. Uh, this, we use this in likelihood, but it's not. Um, yeah, well, I mean, explain more what you mean. Right, so for that, so if our if my tip data is you know zero one one something discrete, I can use the Lucky equation we talked about earlier. We take the Q matrix and let's exponentiate it, right? If my data is you know, zero point zero, eleven point zero, one point one, or something like that, I can use this model instead, right? Yeah, but both give you likelihoods out in the same way. The other model we can say if I want to say what is this state here. Try to find a way to maximize the likelihood. The same thing as this. Right. I want to try changing branch lengths. So that's the same thing. Try with this too. So all this we do with discrete states. And the same sort of thing here with continuous states. People all okay now? <coughs> so this odd thing here. The variance of the variance. What does this mean? This means the amount of shared evolutionary time on the tree. Right? So, how much time does D share with D? Right. Variance. Yeah. 
how much time does A share with B? Speaks matrix. Right? And it's that time times a rate, basically. Okay, so we have then we're picking this time on the one bar. So that's the random variance matrix, and here we have a vector of minutes. Okay. And in the general Brownian motion case, for all the case in which the root is the same as the root. Okay. So then if I'm moving from a point in a Brownian motion, I have to do it multiple times. I get a mean distribution centered on the starting point. Okay. There are other models where we change the mean value. All right, that's the basic structure. Okay. Now let's go into talk about how the evolution can actually happen. Okay. <coughs> so think about how a continuous rate can actually change in a tiny, tiny instant. Okay. We look at change randomly, increases to increase slightly due to chance. Right? Or it could be go pulled directionally. Okay. What would be examples of these processes? So let me uh, to randomly change change the trait. Great. Okay. Good. How about this? Section. Okay. Is just the only way to do this? Mutations. Good. How about selection for this? Okay, All right, so you don't know the direction of such k checking. Right. Good, what else? Cause selection, do it randomly. A stable and saying no. Um, if you're being, if the thing being selected towards each little time step moves, then you could, you could stay on that peak, right? But then actually how you move is random direction. So putting this into math speak, the change in a tiny instant of time, this, is equal to random change, right? So it's a normal distribution, okay? Which is then scaled by our sigma, our rate. Okay, so our rate of wiggle. Okay. And it has to be pulled towards some value, theta. Okay. This tells us which way we go, right? So <coughs> if we're small with data. This would do all in one in one instant, right? So if we're if theta is five, if we're at three, we change by two, we change our delta would be two in one time step. That's how we fast. Let's scale that too. Okay. So now we have this alpha to scale that. So how slow we get there. Okay. <coughs> so this is a more general process or an orthogonal process. And so when we think about it, is if you've ever seen one of those kids on a string at the mall, right? It's like that kid's being trying to get away and is just stuck there, right? So it's being directionally pulled towards the data. Right? If you give the kid sugar, this goes up, right? Trade wiggle goes up. We have lower lower bands, subtraction goes up. Okay? If you know dad comes and sticks the can here, the theta changes. How does this relate to evolution? What's the point of all this? What can you do with this? Mm -hmm. Right. So, if we care about you know we care about how strong the selection is, right, we can estimate. It. What else can we do? So if, if you think that the signal is proportional to mutation, then plus some of the unmutationally variable. Good. How about this? Mm -hmm. Yep, so we think it has the environment of the optimal chain. Right? Um, so examples can use famously in anolis lizard, right? So they're in eco-morphs in anolis. And so you have 
kind of graphs and the um, tree trunks. You could say the ones that are in tree trunks have a different optimal state and body size than the ones that are in grasses. You put that in this model. Now let's look again, let's stay general, right? So one thing I could do is I could have this set of rate parameters for just this branch, this portion of this branch right here. Right? And then I can have another time instant, and I can have different values for here. Okay? Why may I do that? Right, so things, things change over time, right? And so if, this, if you know, the KT event is right here, right? You know, big rock fell from outer space, and there's no more big dinosaurs, just small dinosaurs left. You know, the optimality can change. You may want to have a different data for after that point. Okay? <coughs> and I continue this painting across the whole tree. Right? Now in practice, this would get crazy. Right? I don't want to have a different great camera for every second of time. Right? You, want to, you want to simplify the model. <coughs> so this model allows you to have heterogeneity in the tree. You also have a different rate for this plane versus this plane. So. Okay. And it's interesting because a lot of questions, you think about this sort of heterogeneity, right? So grass anoles versus trunk crown anoles. Okay. So you want to think about paint on, do, you know, here's the grass one, here's the trunk crown one, let's try to let's try fitting different models. I'm assuming one model across the entire tree of life. Do oak trees have the same body size optimum as an old? Probably not. <coughs> Any questions about this? Okay, so that's a good question. So, let's say my model I care about is I have one optimal body size for trunk crown nodes and one for grass nodes. Okay. So, what's your actual question with these? I want to say, you know, the trunk ones are bigger than the ground ones, the grass ones. So, what's the, first of all, what's the null? What would I compare this to? It's an alternate model. What? Right, they're different. So it could say, you know, H0 is or equal H1. Okay. So what do I do here? How do I test this? Right, so I gotta get the tip data. Good. Okay. Alright, and I know that uh, this is trunk, this is grass, grass, grass. Okay, now what? Okay, so now I have these. Two distinct models, right? How would I compare models? <coughs> right, so I can compare body sizes, but I can also, I mean, but I want to do that in a phylogenetically correct manner, right? So I want to use it in this overall, I want to use an model. Right? But I can figure out the likelihood of the data given my model. Okay, so now what? So I tell you that this model has the likelihood of A and the total likelihood of B. Okay? Now what? Okay, AAC. So why do you why don't you do AAC? Mm -hmm. Right. 
So remember, ASC is a way of minimize, measuring how much information we lose about reality from a model. So we want the model that, shoot, that has the lowest AIC value loses the least amount of information. Okay? So I can compute the AICs for them and find out if this model has an AIC of 5 and this model has an AIC of 7. Which model is better in that case? Top one. Right? So I could also just write it as delta AIC of 0. Right? Okay, that's one way to compare models. You can also look at a lucky ratio test instead of nested. So we do that too. Or we could rig up a Bayesian approach too. Okay? But the basic idea is you can compare these two models based on their likelihood or some function of the likelihood, like AAC, and let's get out the question that way. Okay? You can also get the parameter estimates. So we can say, all right, under this model, my um, data is under the true rate model I get this for the trumpet data and this for the ground data and under the one rate model I get this for both data so I can see how these parameter estimates are could be Good question. So we can think about what this set of models are. So <coughs> there's a general model, right, which we've talked about. So one restriction is single rate grounding motion. Right, so just what we were talking about earlier, we just wiggle through time. Okay? And everything has the same rate. There's no attraction. Okay? Um, and we use this a lot. So we use this when we compare um, any kind of sample we talk about, we use it to be constructional. Okay, it's a very simple model, very few parameters. <coughs> we can do a multiple mean model, right? Where we allow this to vary and this to vary. I'm oh, sorry, this to be the same, this to be the same, this to vary. Okay? Like we did here. Okay? <coughs> we could do a model where we have running motion to allow the rate itself to vary. That's maybe this could be the faster than the other could. <laughs> or now we have a method where we can, you know, have you know, some variables. So we can say, on <coughs> this part of the tree, I have one thick theta. This part of the tree, I have another theta. This part of the tree here, I have one sigma here, and a different sigma here, and so forth. Because now I can vary all of them. One thing you should look at in how science works is the year of these publications. All right, so 85, and then passes, and then it's 7. No means of this, and then it passes. This is four, it's like something else. Right. Having been from one rate and running to two rates, 2006. Right, so even though you can see that this sort of general model seems obvious to us now, you know, building up to that. All right. So, in social state estimation, let's talk about this. So here we have a continuous trait, a tip, right in our tree, and we plot it on the x-axis when you can put them down. you want to use these? Will this give you? Why don't you care about ancestral states?
Uh, it would help you maybe put fossils in a tree for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so you could say, you know, were there large fruits around before there were mammals to disperse them? Right, and so there's fossil evidence for that. You also look at the phylogenetic evidence for that. Yeah, so on this tree, so it's clear. This represents the time where the height is set by the tree, and where that node is horizontally set by the initial state. So normally we draw our trees this way, right? with a range of branches that look like this. So where the branch heights mean something, this place in here doesn't mean anything. What we're doing here is adding an x-axis, where in this case it's wind length. Right? So now what I do is take this tip and I plot it where this one is. Okay? And I take this tip and plot it where this one is. Awesome. Okay. Um, same thing with these. Now I have these tip states, and I can say, okay, for the physical ancestor of this one and this one, what's the optimal state for that one? And that occurs here, so. Okay. And then this one and that one might occur here. And this one and that one might occur here. So now I can learn both what time from this tree, but also what the character is. Okay. Right, so that's a good situation where it always thinks, it's always mutating towards bigger body size. So what you should see is a tree like that. In fact, it's hard to pick up. That's true. It depends on what's causing the evolutionary changes. So, if there's a big, if there's a lot of selection, it could be a selection constant with this trend. Then, sure, maybe you go fast and you have difficulty deciding small and small. So, there's actually a better way to get that. <coughs> the thing about a trend itself is it's hard to estimate because they look at the tips, which when you shoot they can't tell the trend. Right? It's hard to tell if you have a tree of three different kinds. Because it's a few fossil taxa. So, does that make sense? So, <coughs> for our binary trees, right, this is the, if I took our tree of like, you know, state 0, 1, 2. The plot it such that I have you know, all the ones here, a few here, all the other ones, and then branches there. Here, you can see the plot. Yeah. 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 By moving this around and see what that's like. Um, if we're way up here, we're going to look at the back of the room. So it's going to be out here. Questions about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <coughs> so with this multivariate normal, are all these questions, right? Look at the different rates of evolution. Right? Um, so look at single rate of evolution, different rates of evolution, attraction, so say estimation, even more. Okay. So again, it's a very, very simple model, but it allows us to have a lot of power in what we can do with the phylogeny. Answer questions. Okay. One thing you can do with it is looking at correlation. Okay, so ecologists out there. Do the plot. Be careful with this plot. What does this mean? Mm 
-hmm. Right. Does that make sense as an ecologist? So I have this big expensive leaf, so I toss it quickly. And this tiny cheap leaf, I hold on to it for life. Okay. Good. So your hypothesis would be that stuff over here is where it is. Any problems with this? So, by the way, each dot here represents a species. Oh, this is, all, all of this is observations. So I just I observed, you know, 80 species of plants and recorded their leaf size and leaf lifespan and just plot it. Excellent. Yes. Yes. So you've now passed the four. Why is that important? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You correlate due to the shared ancestry. So that's the thing for you. Okay. If you like this, you should be instinctively horrified. So you say, oh, but they haven't controlled for anything. They haven't controlled for relatedness. Okay. Now, they might, they might, it, so we can control for relatedness, but it doesn't actually matter. Okay. Cool. So we still have the story. We could find, in this case, it completely falls apart. We'll see why. So be afraid. <coughs> so here's a paper by Felsenstein showing two clades of equal size. And here's my traits. And say, oh, look, nice correlation here. Power, and we find a good R squared, and I'm happy. Okay. But it could be that all the squares come from this clade and all the spiders come from this clade. Right? Then are you are you as, as confident about this correlation? Why not? Those same points. Right. And so it could happen because there's one change in one trait here, one change in another trait, trait there. So it's two changes. And then I have sort of oversampled this. Look, I see a whole bunch of correlation. There's two changes happening in the okay. <coughs> How do we deal with this? How do we fix this? Okay. How so? Good. Yep. Exactly. You're a modern day Felsenstein. Um, so, right, so let's take this tree, and I'll be show you this method we call independent contracts. It's just that approach. But rather than looking at these as a broad tip value, these are these sort of sister pairs. These are sort of sister comparisons. So I compare x1 and x2. Right? Okay. So these are the sister pairs. So I compare 4 and 5. Okay. Now I can reconstruct what's happening here, and I compare this with this. Then can compare this with this. Okay. I've all these comparisons. I've used each branch just once. I see the branches are independent of each other. So now I've gone from five tip 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 points, right? We have all these you know non-dependence problems to four observations, inferences, contrast to call them that ha have independence. Okay. So we've, so we've lost. You know, one data point in order to fix this whole problem. It works really well, I'll try it off, okay? Um, <coughs> and there's some stuff with the variance that I'm going to go into, in dealing with using um, normalizing for the variance, and some, you know, we're using an estimated state, an observed state, and some nuances that way. But for you, you will mostly just be using the program to do contracts. The big lesson here is you know, thinking about doing methods like contracts and controlling for so in this case, we have this nice correlation, okay? And if I take that and then add the tree, and then do it with independent contrasts, I get this. Yeah. See, if you do this, you get less publishable work. I know. No. But <laughs> you get the right answer. Right? And so this big contrast we have earlier is just this one point. Okay? 
where we had angiosperms have short, so small leaves, they hold for a long time. Sorry, angiosperms have large leaves, they hold for a short time. And conifers have short leaves, they hold for a long time. So all these points just come from conifers are down here, angiosperms are up here. You get this correlation, and it gives them that single change. Okay? <coughs> so if you had ignored contrast, we've got more. Much of a question. Yep. Conifers and germs. Um, and so I'll continue with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll do one minus two. Okay. I'll do one minus two. So you get these branches. I'll do 3 minus 4. I'll do 11 minus 12. I'll do this with that. Like 5 minus 6. So, so eventually I'll do 13 minus 18. Which is this contrast here. Okay. And that's this x. So these up here are all common comparisons, so all dot dots. And these here would all be anything. Okay. Yep. <coughs> so basically, you do it. What do you do um, but using only information at the same time. Yeah, it's the same time. Yeah, it's the same time. Yeah, it's the same time. So normally it's just for like getting social states using higher trait. Higher trait is pretty associated with this one here. I don't just look at the same time. I could have a piece of the tree that's, say, huge. I don't want to look at that information. I'm using higher trait for some social states. But for this, is you don't want to <coughs> use information from outside of the tree, it's so independent. It's using the same part. Yep. All you need to do is get a tree. And if you don't have a tree, you're out of luck. This is why we sort of have to get a tree. If you have a tree, we have this problem, we have to do it. Right? So if you can get a phylomatic tree, you can do this. Okay. Second, Michelle, one thing people can do is to make up random trees and do it. You can show them that making up completely random trees and doing this is something not doing it at all. So, okay. Turns out life's in general. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, just as a teaching example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, in general, you just see you just see a plot of points. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a little differently, yeah. And so there are other, other, or you can do also like positive correlations and things like that. And those tend to use the trees and error structure for correlation. Yep. Um, it's so it's similar to this in flavor, but.
Yeah, like how can you fix it in this case to the computer? It could have been something that happened probably in the same way. But you can do it with every picture of a pairing on the tree. Uh, yeah. 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 You can actually use contract back with data. Let's say if you have a bunch of traits. And you do, you can say the way Ryan described it, which is really weird. I've seen it done, it's really valid. You can actually take a bunch of traits and do contrast with each trait. You can say it with each trait. You can say it. So actually, you can use this data. That's true. Yeah, I mean, the original goal of this whole method was to get you know, nice IID data. Other questions or comments? Okay. So, main points from this section are this continuous trait model. You can use the same way we're using the discrete trait model, and then the need to control for relationships when you have correlations like this. Okay. Now let's talk about tree stretching. Um, so here's the aforementioned Felsenstein. Let me show you these stretch trees. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. So we have, you know, this sort of model here, right? Where, where this covariance matrix is basically both the rate and also our branch, branch rates. Okay. And <coughs> we have also, you know, a discrete model too we talked about before, right? And they also branch lengths matter. Right? So we do this rates of t, but that t is just the branch length. Okay. So all tree stretching is <coughs> is you take your tree and then you mess with the branch length in some way and calculate what it could be down. Okay. Why would you do this? Yeah, why does it be a useful parameter for into our model? Right, so one thing you can do is clocking. Right? So, and again, with the, um, if we're talking about the molecular clock, right, all we're doing there is stretching a tree, and there our model is a discrete state model. Right? We're seeing if that if branches stretch to make a clock like are much worse in likelihood than branches that all have to be free. Good, it's not the case. No, so, okay, so there's, yeah, so, right, so there's the visual effect of the stretching, right, I think about the model effect, so, yeah. So, what the stretching is like is saying, time going faster for these talks are faster, right? So, so you, you, you could also, lambda doesn't, other stretching is can't, right? So, lambda is the whole tree stretching. Right? And in this case, if we, You you find that the data fits this tree a lot worse than this tree. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. uh, no, it's just, people don't do that, but you can try that. So, think about what, what you mean by that. So, <coughs> one thing you think about is, you know, think that only, you know, one way to interpret a model like that is that um, things uh, evolve much faster than the speciation. Right, so all the internal branches all do that speciation events, and no one's having it. There's no special level to do that. So your model, if you have that good model, the way you can test it is just by trying to avoid it. Okay. Um. <coughs> Delta lets you, because 
to approve, we can try to do in more change early or more change late. So we have a model of, say, niche filling with that radiation. But it could be that first all which is available, so you hop over and see very quickly you can put some pinpoint place. And that's the easy one. We put that by a model where it's finishing very fast and this will slow down. We also do a kappa. So maybe we have a model where change happens only in speciation events. Change by the environmental speciation events. Right? So if we go to this model, then it doesn't matter anymore, only in the speciation events matters in terms of amount of change. Okay? We can also all that time. Okay? We can see anything. Does my name have anything to talk about in terms of the change? We'll talk about a little briefly about push rate equilibrium. Right, this idea that you don't have this gradual change through time, instead you have change happening only at speciation rates. Right. Um, note that it's not quite the thing as this model. Right, so Paul says that at speciation rates, one species changes, one species doesn't. Okay. So this model is saying at speciation rates, one species changes, one okay. It's not quite the same, but it gives the same flavor. And there actually are approaches that test this directly. Okay, which allow changing happening along branches, but also big changes happening at speciation events. Okay. Um, then you can go having a rate and rate before or after event. Right? So maybe the rate slows down after the KT. Okay. If you want to create a crazy new model for this, all you have to do is say, smush that part of the tree. Let's see how much we smush it by. That gives us a rate from screen. And the nice thing about these approaches is you can, you, you can, you can stretch separately from your lucky calculation. Right? So I can try stretching, and then I can use my continuous model and my discrete state model, very close to it. So I think it's different from here. You can do the model and look at it that way. Right. What sort of questions can we answer with this? Do you have any ideas? I don't know what I've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. Nice, you can, you can do a good job estimating your tree branch lengths. Good. What else? Right, so maybe you have a faster rate of evolution after you become invasive. Right? So you fit that by saying, you know, the, the parts of the tree that are invasive species get longer branches. But they almost estimate that rate. There you go, it's a new method. So what else? Maybe like what? Good thing about certain behaviors affect rate of evolution. Right? Um, so, does maternal care slow your rate of evolution because you have fewer offspring and see those variations? So you could test that with these stretching models. Good. Another thing you can do is sort of thing is dealing with heterogeneity. Okay, so we know heterogeneity happens. See it in plants. That's an older slide. 
Um, and remember that most models assume that on a tree like this, there's one rate of evolution. Right? So we know that from the raw molecular distances, you know, there's much lower rates in really than facials. Now, okay, now we turn to be a clock-like tree. Now we assume that the rate of evolution of flower size is one rate. No, no, it's different. Rate, right? So you can then deal with it, deal with it by using stretching. Or, you know, comparing elephants to bats, right? They probably evolve very differently. So there's a bunch of ways to deal with heterogeneity. This one's from that paper I had to read. So one way, there is no heterogeneity. It's nice, a simple model. Right? And I can do it either using my Q matrix, discrete state approach, or my continuous approach. Okay, that's great. I can do partitioning, we talked about, right? So I can say one rate of evolution for this gene, one rate for that gene, or one rate for um, total traits, one rate for traits. Okay, so you can just put it that way. <coughs> I can also use a discrete gamma. As we talked about this, you can use, you know, probably like the lead you under one rate, or the lead under another rate, and sum them up, right? So this distribution is I can do a mixture model. Okay. <coughs> so I can apply these two models to both sets of characters. So what does this look like? All right. So our normal model is this. All right. Probably the data is proportional to our rate matrix, or the general, and the tree. Okay. So the normal Okay. And I just cross all of my characters. Okay. With a mixture model, same thing, but now rather than having one set of model parameters, I have a bunch of sets of model parameters. I'm going to cross all of them. Okay. So gamma is like this, but just for gamma. So if you don't want to do it, cross all the parameters. Okay. <coughs> and so here's a case where they do this for. Um, Gene, which has two different rate matrices, and one rate matrix fits this gene better, and one fits this gene better. So you can use the one you can both. Okay. Okay. Another thing you can do is branch heterogeneity. Right? So, either the invasive species and even the native species. Right? Either the native ones have different rates. So you can just drop two rates out. Under both discrete state models, And finally, we can do time heterogeneity, like pre post KT. This is also being pretty obvious, right, at this point. However, <coughs> we're still doing this very well. So, pre scratching, we do for both. Um, some of the heterogeneity approaches, we do very, very little for discrete. Right? Some for the DNA data, but not for other data. Even though it's the same basic model, we need time. We need time. Model. APGC, can do it. Zero and one, no. Really not do it. Yeah, do some of that. And then mixing them, from here to from here. So, <coughs> it's important for you to know, if you have a question that deals with heterogeneity over trade, you know, exactly there's nothing published about doing it with binary data, doesn't mean you can't do it. It seems no one's named it yet. You still go ahead and Do you have any questions about this? I'm clear. Let's see how it's being relevant to your research. How many of you are going to be doing a couple of species? Um, so, how is so, any example how it's relevant for you? So what are your questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So did you your overall study about climate change and people's responses? Okay. I mean, even for just that simple comparison, though, it's people aren't intended. Okay. 
the privilege with correcting that with negative things also the positive thing, you can then project pieces you don't have data on that, how will they respond to climate change based on the relevant stuff. Does that make you do ancestral site reconstruction? You can do tip site reconstruction too. So this means that if this species that isn't such relative, it's going to have a hard time because you watch it. Who else? And so, you know, it's just like the Andrews Brown chemical thing, where, you know, you could treat it as I add nutrients to these six species and I see how these six responses are. Right? But that's not right because it's not Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we need multiple pot species or multiple populations of sort of subspecies of other species. Alright, we'll have a five minute break and then Jeremy. Thank you.